Hello everyone, my name is Mikael Sala. I started working on Linux and security a long time ago, and particularly on Nunlock more than five years ago. At first, it was a personal project motivated by personal needs. I wanted to take control of my own data to be able to know which application were able to access some specific files. Then I continued this work with my previous employer, the French National Cyber Safety Agency, and now with Microsoft. This XKCD comic illustrates um, what is a common issue with uh, current traditional in this workstation. It says, if someone steals my laptop while I'm logged in, they can read my email, take my money, and impersonate me to my friends, but I leave, they can't install drivers without my permission. That is very true. And you can think about um, your personal pictures, your bank document, your SSH key, PHP keys, uh, email, and so on. The thing is, just security for traditional system is designed to protect the system, not the user and his or her data. So, what is it about? This talk is not about kernel protection. Um, bug fixing, integrity hardening, can attack super solution, all this stuff are really important, of course. But this talk is focused on access control and risk mitigation for user space developers to protect their users. The idea is to limit damage of expected bugs, which may be known or not, fixed by ongoing update or not. The audience is mainly application developers, system administrators, poor users, hackers, privacy protecting people. As developers, we are responsible for what we put in the end of our user. So here's the plan. This talk focuses on the user lock by user space, explains the rationale behind the design, how backward and forward compatibility are handled, what features are currently available, and what could come next. The state of security for application nowadays. The initial assumption is mainly the trusted computing base, TCB. Applications chosen by users or system administrator are trusted, trusted from the user point of view. In a system, at least some user space application must be trusted, otherwise you cannot build on anything. Trust means that we trust the honesty and well intention of the developers. There is multiple and different level of trust and different consequences in case of a breach, particularly on the system, on the user, and on application data. Trust doesn't mean that applications are bulletproof, nor safe to use in any condition. And last but not least, supply chains are deemed secure. The conviction is secure enough, and other critical parts of the system are trusted and deemed uncompromised. So, here are the threats we are tackling. An innocuous and trusted process can become malicious during its lifetime because of bugs exploited by attackers or just triggered by users. And Application can be misused by user, but this user should not be considered malicious, of course, because here we want to protect these users. What is sandboxing? And sandboxing can be used for different meanings, but in this talk it is used as a security approach, not a binary state. The threat models for sandboxing are, well, 
protecting from vulnerable code maintained by the developer, so itself. Protecting from malicious third party code that may be trusted, was the case, but sometimes accidents happen. And last but not least, the threat model can be defined by the developers as it fits best for a specific application. Why do we need sandboxing? Perfect security doesn't fit with pragmatic development. Bulletproof and useful software is costly, not only with money, but with time, developer, and skills. And in fact, it is very difficult to achieve, if ever possible. And the need to add an application. Because we don't want, as developer, to participate to malicious actions through our software, which might come from an exploited bug, a vulnerability, leveraged by an attacker. It is also important to note that responsibility of user data is kind of overseen by developers. There is multiple solutions to answer these issues. One of them is the maxing, but there is multiple ones. First, of course, um, well, there is a um, reactive solution, which is to fix bugs quickly and patch updates. But more importantly, there is proactive solutions to look for bugs and fix them, of course, uh, to do some testing, to add more tests and use them, to use safe languages, libraries, compiler options, and so on. And in this case, uh, we should consider more software as poten potentially malicious and protect the rest of the system from them. That is sandboxing. State of the art. There is here a partial list of non-Linux systems. The GNU sandbox is used by iOS and macOS. There is also the app container used in Windows, um, which is, for example, used uh, in web browsers. FreeBSD implemented Capsicum, which is a capability system, which is a way to delegate access rights on specific resources. And OpenBSD developed Pledge and Unveil, which enable to um, well, create sandboxes, especially for the file system. So it's pretty similar to Linux. But what about Linux? There's a lot of features available in traditional Linux system. We can identify a set of security features which are available to the system. And by system here, I mean the system administrator of a vendor, for example, of an appliance. There is an um, authentication system, um, a firewall with NAT filter, a common access control system, which is called uh, the discretionary access control system, DAC. There is also a monetary access control system, for example, SA Linux. Second, that may be used by um, OpenSSH, for example, and NoLock. But here, there is only a subset of these features which are available to the end user. And here, I'm talking about an unprivileged user, not a root user, specifically. So there's still the Distributionary access control system, second and lock. And if you want to take a look at what is available to app developers, well, app developer can safely use second and now landlock, but the other systems may not be um, independent enough from the application. We can now compare different kinds of sandboxing implementation. There's four categories here. The first one is performance. 
performance is relative performance. For example, to exchange data um, between sandboxes or between the off system and a sandbox. For example, to exchange files. The fine grain control category is to identify systems that enable to set specific access rights on specific resources, for example, to be able to read files, to list directories, to do specific actel, and so on. The embedded policy category means to be able to embed a full standard policy in an application. So that is really targeting app developers. And the unfriend use category is to identify mechanisms that can be used in an unfledged way, which means that they don't need special Linux capabilities or system configuration or SYD binaries. So when we think about compartmentalization, we may think about virtual machine. These are great tools, but they are not what we're looking for sandboxing. Mm, there's no easy way to exchange data between virtual machines, except if you, if you rely on the network or if you share um, a full block device or if you share a specific file system between virtual machines or virtual machine and the host. Well, virtual machines are, are not designed to do access control with fine grain uh, control. Well, you cannot embed virtual machine in application and most of the time running virtual machine requires some privileges. Interesting as control system is SLinux, but that may be the same for Apamor, Smack, or Tomoe. These are implemented in the Linux scanner, so they are performant. There is a fine grain control way to set permission on processes, user, and files. You cannot directly embed a security policy in an application because well the security policy is designed to be enforced at the system level most of the time at boot time and as in Linux well we can good privileges to be able to enforce the security on all the processes of the system. Then there's containers and especially namespaces. Um, well, as well, they're designed to be performance. Uh, there's some issues uh, potentially with uh, network namespaces. Well, namespaces are not an access control system per se, so you cannot uh, indicate that um, a specific file can be access with a specific set of uh, actors, for example. You kind of embed a policy in an application. And this may require um, to use infinite user namespaces. And this kind of user namespaces come with limitations. And there also may be kind of a risk for the kernel because there's a lot of complexity there. And well, that may not be a good idea. Second BPF is a really interesting feature. In shell, it is a firewall for system calls. So it is designed um, to be quite performant. Um, 
well, it is not access control system passy, so there's no find range control of access to files. It is designed to be embedded in application, so that's really good. And it is designed to be used in an unfinished way. And finally, there is now Lanlock. The idea with Lanlock is to check all these boxes to be performant, to be able to express fine grain control for our next control system, to embed an Lanlock security policy in an application, and to use it without requiring specific privileges like SYD binaries. But what is Lonlock exactly? Lonlock is a set of features available since Linux 5.13 to create indexes. It is a way to restrict ambient write according to the current semantic, for example, uh, to restrict access to the file system for a set of processes because second is not an access control system. Lanlock is a way to create safe security sandboxes as new security layers in addition to the existing system-wide access control. For example, the DAG system um, or SLNX. With Lanlock, we can compose access controls from multiple tenants, for example, the system administrator app developers, or even cloud clients. The limitation is that it is a kernel feature, so there is no use space semantic here. For example, there is no way to filter in an inefficient way uh, debus communications. This should be implemented well in other space. Here are some use cases. Lenlock is interesting for built-in application sandboxing and sandbox managers, mainly. With the current features, um, it is only possible to add on parsers, which is really important because they, uh, they take interested inputs most of the time. Um, with the current implementation, it is also possible to um, restrict application um, with limited file renaming and linking. We'll see later um, specific uh, limitations here. And it's also interesting for monolith application dealing with different level of confidentiality, which may be the case for web browsers dealing with different websites different domains, and for example, for specific services dealing with different user accounts. What could come next will enable to use Lenlock for system services in a general way, but also for general container and sandbox managers, for example, Docker, Flatpak, or even Fidel. The current access control features are focused on the file system. The idea is to allow Thread and its future children to access a set of file archives. There's multiple actions, um, which are kind of common. For example, to be able to execute, read, or write a file, to be able to list a directory or remove files from Basic set of directories, or be able to create files with basic kind of files. There's some limitation um, with the current implementation, and this is due to the minimum viable product approach, which was used to merge the current core part of Lanlock in the kernel. First limitation is file rebranding, which means to rename or link a file to a different parent directory. This kind of action is always denied in a sandbox uh, 
fit it with Anok. And kind of similar imitation. Um, there's no way to change the file stem topology from inside the sandbox. For example, to do arbitrary mount points and stuff like that. However, a sandbox could still use the Shroot system code, which may be useful for security purposes. Automatic key restriction. Because Lenok is designed to be used in an unprivileged way, we need to handle composition of layer of policies, which means to have multiple sandbox layers. All applications, including shells, are allowed to create their own sandbox, which may create archies of sandbox. For example, if your desktop shell creates a sandbox, and then you want to launch a web browser, which may create its own sandbox too, then there is two levels of sandbox. Then there is a hierarchy. And what is important here is that a sandbox can only drop more axes, not gain more accesses, of course, otherwise it would be a privilege escalation. And to avoid other privilege escalation, it is also forbidden to access um, parent or sibling sandbox processes. Introspection, well, mainly using P-trace, of course it's not in child sandbox, or the same sandbox, is forbidden. Indeed, introspection could lead to impersonation, which may be used to bypass a sandbox security place. Let's see an example. There's a first process here, P1, which may create a new process P2, and then this process P1 want to sandbox itself. So it can create a new sandbox. So it is a sandbox creator, which create a sandbox domain. But in this case, P2, which was created before the sandbox, is not in the sandbox. So the sandbox hierarchy is different from the process hack. If P1 now create a new process, P3, then this process will automatically be restricted by the sandbox domain created by P1. But this P3 process can also create a new sandbox, nested one. And in this case, Restriction from the first sandbox and the second sandbox are all enforced on P3 and all its new children. Like for example here, P4. So now let's see a demo. This is a virtual machine running with Linux enabled. We can see that by looking at the boot log messages. So I'm logged as root, um, and I will do this demo as root, but I can do the same uh, with any other users. But it is interesting because root most of the time can do anything. In his case, I will be able to restrict even the root user. I will use a sandbox manager, which is available with the Linux source code. So you can't uh, use it freely. This sandbox manager is a simple helper 
which can take multiple arguments as uh, environment variable. If I run this command, it will launch a shell, bash, which will then only be allowed to access in a read-only way slash bin, slash, slash, uh, slash pro, and so on. And uh, in a read-wide way, slash dev null, slash dev full, and slash tmp. Okay, we are now in a new shell. Let's look at some properties of this process. We can see here that the new prefix bit is set. So this does, does not mean that Nanlock is enabled, but in our case, the sandboxer set this bit. We are still in the root directory. However, because it is not listed in the directory that we should be allowed to have access, we cannot list the content of this directory. And it is the same for the slash directory. We can also try to create a new file on the current directory. And this is not possible. However, we can list the slash tmp directory and create a new file there. Last and not least, we can test if we can impersonate some important processes, for example, the init process. And you can see that it is not allowed anymore. We go out of the sandbox. We can trust it, of course, which may not be a good idea anyway. Thanks to security policy computation, we gain a lockless confident deployment. There is no bottleneck because of one global policy, which may, for example, be the case um, with a global SLNX policy. It is also easier to maintain a set of small policies. And because policies can be embedded within the code, we get security policies tailored to an application. Developers know how it works and what is required. So that makes sense. And of course, this can be kept in sync with evolving business logic over time with updates. And this can also enable to dynamically build security policies according to application configuration, and then be able to adapt uh, to this configuration. And finally, because it is a standard user space feature, can be tested like any other features. That is very good. Now let's go a bit deeper in Nano. First, a bit of vocabulary. An object in Unlock is a kernel resource, maybe a file, file key, process, socket, and so on. An action on an object. Maybe, for example, to list the content of a directory, to write a file, to create a pipe, and so on. A landlock rule is a set of actions on an object. And a rule set is a set of rules. In landlock, in landlock the subject enforcing a city policy on itself is the coding process. It is implicit. So, how to use Nanlock? Well, there are three system calls that are available now. The Nanlock create toolset syscall, 
the non-log add rule syscall and the non-log restrict self syscall. The first step is to create a rule set. You need to define a set of access that will be denied by default. Then you call the syscall that create a rule set and you gain a new file descriptor, which is a rule set file descriptor. The second step is to add rules. Here we define a part beneath rule, which contain a set of allowed accesses and identify the file hierarchy thanks to a file descriptor. Then we add this rule to the rule set file descriptor thanks to the Linux add rule syscall. The third step is to enforce this rule set. And because Unlock is an unprivileged access control system, we first need to pledge to the system, to the kernel, that will not gain new privileges. For example, by executing an SYD binary. This is achieved thanks to the, the new privs common. And then we can enforce the rule set on the coding process thanks to the non-log restrict self with the rule set file descriptor. There's multiple developer tools. First, libc's. Uh, there's glibc 2.34 and soon mother libc, which include the non-log syscall IDs. Strace, which is really useful for debugging and now support non-lock syscall arguments. And there's two interesting libraries, one written in Go and for Go development, and another written in Rust for Rust developments. And one important point is the compatibility, kernel compatibility. The problem here is that application developer may not be aware of the kernel on which the application will run. It is better for users to implement best for security, which means to use available sandbox features as much as possible. But if there is none, well, most of the time you want your application to run anyway. Then I will gain new features over time, so application must be prepared to run on your kernel. The solution was to design landlock schools as backward and forward compatible with previous and future kernel versions. Let's see what is backward compatibility. Backward compatibility is, for example, running application developed for a new kernel on an old kernel. The solution is to rely on the ability to probe the kernel to get the landlock ABI version which indicates the sandbox features supported by the running kernel. And then your space library can map kernel features according to this landlock ABI version. The other side is a future proofness. Running application developed from old kernel on a new kernel. The solution, well, is mainly imposed by the Linux kernel API that must always be compatible with previous version. With unlock, we also use extensible structs as syscall argument to enable flexible addition of future features. A struct can be larger than expected, but the unknown fields must contain zeros. This is why we not only add the rule set attribute structure, but also specify the size of this structure. And another 
important point for future-proofness is to add optional flags, which are here. And they are set to zero. The Canaro map for unlock is an ongoing effort. But here is a summary. In the short term, the idea is to improve kernel performance for the current features, but also to add the ability to change the band directory, to reparent the file, like we saw in previous slide. The medium term roadmap is to add other features to ease debugging, to extend file system access control types to address the current limitations, and to add the ability to follow a deny listing approach, which is required for some use cases. In the long term, well, there's a lot of features, but some of these features are to add minimal network access control types. And add the ability to create file descriptor capabilities compatible with Capsicum. Of course, I'm sure you have a long wish list. Please share it. Let's wrap up. Lenlock empowers developers to add on the application and protect user data by managing tailored and composable security policies. New kernel releases will lift current limitation, improve performance, and bring new sandboxing features. There are also high-level Go and Rust libraries, a mailing list, and a website. Thank you for your attention, and feel free to ask any question in the chat.